Thank you very much, Johannes. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this discussion. And just to give a little bit of context, so this is, this was a research that myself and my co-authors, uh, Emilio de Petris Chauvin and Ruben Durante, had been working on uh, for, for a while, kind of on and, on and off, sort of trying to understand, uh, understand the political impact of uh, uh, emotions, uh, particularly fear and anxiety. And then when, uh, so, uh, so we were doing this in the context of the uh, uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014, which as I'm gonna argue is, is particularly interesting for that. But then uh, COVID happened and, and really felt this sense of urgency to sort of think about how this uh, matters in this, in this present context. And I'm gonna try to argue uh, uh, why, why I think it matters uh, uh, substantially. So first of all, uh, when we think about sort of what's the political impact of a pandemic, right? And, and particularly this year in the US where we have a presidential election, how should we think about that? Well, first of all, uh, uh, as we are all uh, very much experiencing right now, COVID-19 is just this enormous shock that is affecting uh, our lives in a number of uh, uh, different ways. And it seems uh, very much uh, uh, implausible to think that this would not have uh, political uh, effects uh, in this context. And, and I would like to sort of distinguish between three uh, uh, different kinds of impact that I think we could see here. One is, is the economic shock that it represents, right? So all the social distancing measures and not just, this, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental shock is really, you know, the, 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 the presence of the virus and, and the, the, the concern that it raises about in, interacting normally and how that uh, uh, then, you know, basically shuts down big parts of the economy. So it's just an enormous shock. Uh, we can anticipate a major recession, you know, probably already ongoing, and there's going to be fallout from this, uh, uh, given that it's well understood that uh, uh, economic circumstances uh, have substantial impacts in, in uh, presidential elections. The second one is that this being an enormous uh, shock, it requires and is requiring an enormous policy response and there's also uh, a, a lot of reason, uh, it's, it's very intuitive and there's a lot of uh, social science evidence that uh, voters uh, 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 care about this when they are forming their opinions uh, on incumbents. So their response to a crisis like this, which we can compare to like a major, major disaster or, or like a war or something on that order of magnitude. So that should uh, uh, affect how people view uh, uh, incumbents at the, you know, the president, but all the way down the line. Uh, and there's, there's one uh, 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 kind of wrinkle to that, which is this tendency, the so-called rally around the flag effect, whereby in moments of crisis, people sort of feel a, a, a certain pull to, to kind of rally around the figure of the, of the president or the incumbent. So there's, there's that as well, but, but, it's, but it's a major shock from that policy perspective as well. And that's, that's gonna play out. Now, but there's a third dimension, which I think is, is uh, quite important and, and perhaps a little bit less uh, uh, self-evident than the other two, which is sort of a psychological dimension, right? So the presence of a threat, in this case, a virus, right? That, that you know, really uh, uh, puts people in sort of in a situation where they're kind of concerned for their health, for the health of their loved ones. Uh, so that triggers a psychological uh, reaction that, uh, uh, you know, could very well affect the behavior of voters as well. And that's the, th this third one is one that I think is, is less understood and I think is gonna be very important here as I'm gonna uh, try to come back. And this is what we're trying to address in this research project. So, you know, it, it's, it's quite natural uh, uh, to, to think that emotions in general are sort of a powerful tool uh, 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 that influences the way people behave uh, in, their, in their political you know, actions, the way voters behave. And in particular, fear uh, uh, is, is often used by politicians. You know, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence and, and you know, sort of evidence documenting this, that politicians use fear to, to mobilize voters, right? Against external threats, you know, you know be them t terrorism, uh, uh, foreigners, uh, uh, um, the list goes on. So that's something that's out there. And there's actually quite a bit of research showing how uh, sort of the impact that this has, sorry, uh, on, on uh, you know, you just put people uh, in a lab, uh, you prime them to feel fear and you see how they react. Uh, 
Uh, but sort of real world uh, uh, evidence of the impact that this has is a little bit harder to get because it's really hard to disentangle the, the effect of, of the emotion from the effect of sort of the broader context in which it arises, right? So, uh, uh, you know, you might see people responding to a threat of uh, terrorism or a threat of, a, a, like, you know, some foreign crisis, but it's hard to disentangle. So what, what is the emotional component of that? And what is sort of a response, sort of a policy judgment? Is the government responding well to this, right? How do I feel, uh, uh, you know, how do my policy preferences uh, uh, might be, uh, uh, you know, affected by the by the context and not just by the emotion, right? So this is kind of hard to disentangle, and I would argue that it's important because it's, it it really generates a lot of incentives for for the way politicians behave. That we're going to get into uh, uh, into some details. So what we do here is to look at the impact that the Ebola scare, we might call it, uh, had in the uh, 2014 midterm elections in the U.S. And it's a very uh, unique context for us to explore this, you know, emotional dimension because there was a, a, a lot of public anxiety, so the perceived threat was quite high. But from from a public health perspective, the the, the actual risk was was quite low. So it's very much different from the COVID situation where we, we do have like a very very uh, uh, urgent public health uh, crisis. And Ebola. The, the, the risk was always kind of on a much uh, uh, smaller magnitude. So we can kind of pinpoint uh, the impact that the anxiety had, and it happened to coincide, as I'm gonna show, with uh, uh, sort of the, the stretch run of the midterm campaigns in that year. So just to give you a, a little bit of context, there was a very, very serious uh, Ebola outbreak in 2014, uh, uh, particularly in West Africa, Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, and Liberia. And this shows you sort of the profile of uh, uh, um, you know, the, the outbreak at the time. So, you know, starting early 2014, it really sort of peaked into the uh, Northern Hemisphere summer months. So it, it was, you know, uh, uh, thousands of cases uh, in these three countries. And it did reach uh, uh, other countries, but in, a, in very small numbers, right? So you see like a very serious uh, uh, um, uh, em emergence in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and uh, uh, Nigeria, which is uh, right uh, next door, uh, Mali, but in, in other countries, it really was a handful of cases. And in particular, in the US uh, had uh, four uh, total cases that were uh, confirmed, and one of them resulted in a death. So just for comparison, in 2009, uh, uh, you know, not even to mention what we're going through right now, but the, the, the flu epidemic uh, of pandemic of 2009 in the US had Six, you know, 59 million cases, hundreds of thousands hospitalized, uh, 12,000 deaths. So, just to give you a sense of, of the public health uh, uh, threat that was uh, uh, that was in play uh, back then. So, it's not to minimize what the crisis was. It really was a very major public health crisis in West Africa and the U.S. You know, it was something that needed uh, uh, addressing. But uh, uh, sorry, the average American was was always at a very low risk uh, uh, of of anything like that. But the uh, uh, impact that it had uh, in the public discourse was much uh, greater than that. So these are just a few screenshots uh, uh, from the time where you, you had like this very strong uh, response in the media, which uh, translated into a, a, a strong response and high levels of anxiety. So just to give you a sense, this is uh, 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 the height of uh, the Ebola scare in the US and we're gonna you know, uh, discuss why it happened at that point in time. So you look at the coverage from uh, 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 broadcast news and uh, cable news. So there was uh, very substantial coverage and the, the, the vertical red line here was uh, election, the election week. And it, it really kind of, in the period just before the election, it reached like a, a, a very high levels. And then it just, in the post-election period, it kind of went down uh, uh, very substantially basically to, uh, to zero, but it was a big deal at that point. So it really uh, uh, allows us to, to answer a number of questions. So first of all, did that panic, did that uh, uh, public anxiety influence voters and, and had an, influ uh, an impact uh, on the election? If so, in which direction did it go? So which in particular in the US, which party benefited from whatever effect happened? if uh, uh, a party benefited from that and why, right? So, so, so through what mechanism, right? What, was it about uh, uh, people changing their views about the issues? Was it about 
people changing their views about the incumbent, the president. Uh, and I think if there is an impact of that sort, we want to think about whether the politicians at the time were responding strategically and perhaps uh, helping to build that type uh, uh, of scenario, right? So, and, and, and how did they do it? And, and, and if they did, was it effective in terms of uh, creating uh, a certain, uh, you know, some of these uh, political reactions? But we have to ask, uh, uh, you know, how do we know that, that Ebola caused all of this, right? And how do we measure the, uh, the extent of that uh, uh, Ebola uh, scare and the, 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 the effect that may have ensued? So this is challenging because it's not just about, you know, if we find a way to measure Ebola, which I'm going to argue we can do, it's not just about, let's say, looking at, you know, places where Ebola concerns were high and seeing if those were the places where uh, uh, Republicans or Democrats did well or not, because it may be that the people, uh, or for instance, it may be that the people who were more likely to be concerned with Ebola, they were more likely to vote one way or another in the first place. So it was not really about sort of the, 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 the anxiety causing the uh, electoral outcome, but more about uh, a, a coincidence between sort of Ebola concerns and some other political factors that may have been in play at the time that were unrelated to that. So that's what we're gonna try to address here. And for that, we're gonna use uh, the specific timing and, and in particular the geographical uh, uh, patterns of the spread of uh, Ebola or you know, the, the, the occurrence of Ebola cases in the US. And there were four cases. Uh, uh, um, first, a Liberian national uh, uh, who was visiting the US was diagnosed and that happens in Dallas, Texas. So that was September 30th, 2014, that it was announced. Then uh, two nurses that uh, 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 were involved in treating this uh, first patient, were uh, they tested positive, and one of them had traveled to Akron, Ohio, uh, in between treating uh, uh, and being exposed and then uh, uh, getting the diagnostic. And finally, one doctor who had been in West Africa was diagnosed with Ebola upon returning to New York City. So there were these three places where the cases uh, 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 were diagnosed or there, there was exposure uh, detected by the CDC, Dallas, Texas, uh, the Cleveland, Akron uh, uh, area in Ohio and New York City. And one thing that we can see is if we try to measure uh, uh, Ebola concerns and we do that, uh, one way in which we do that is by looking at uh, Google searches for the term uh, uh, Ebola, we can see, so the darker colors here are sort of more uh, uh, higher volumes of Google searches. So we can see that these are uh, very much clustered around uh, uh, the, the cases, sort of the geographical location of the cases, right? So in Texas, in uh, Northeast Ohio, and in New York. And uh, another measure for that is tweets mentioning Ebola, and we see a similar pattern as well, right? So people were searching about Ebola, they were tweeting about Ebola, more uh, 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 um, intensively around these areas. This is what these maps are showing. And we can see the timing as well. So the first case happens here, this first vertical line, and the green line shows the volume of searches in Texas, right? So we see that it really peaks immediately upon the first case. Then the, the, the case tra travels to Cleveland and there is this uh, red peak in Ohio sort of immediately afterwards. Texas peaks again, but there's this peak in Ohio. And then New York City, New York City peaks right after the, the case is diagnosed in New York, right? So you see that people are responding uh, geographic in this geographically uh, distinct pattern and in the timing uh, of where sort of that exposure uh, would be, so uh, the risk of exposure would be uh, in people's minds. And then it just uh, uh, collapses uh, back to zero and this is vertical line shows the election date, right? So there's, there is this uh, uh, pattern here and uh, what we're gonna use, the same thing happens for tweets, and we're gonna use this uh, 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 um, uh, geographical exposure, right? Which, uh, as we argue, is not uh, related to particular uh, sort of political patterns or other patterns uh, uh, in terms of, let's say, Ebola concerns before the cases, right? So when we, when we uh, consider sort of the, 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 the underlying uh, political uh, so our pre-existing electoral outcomes, we see that there is no uh, correlation between this distance to the, to, the, to the nearest Ebola case and sort of these patterns that we can, uh, uh, so once we condition on uh, uh, local characteristics, so we can use that 
as a predictor of Ebola concerns, right? So where you are, if you're close to uh, uh, one of these Ebola cases, that is going to lead to more uh, a concern at the local level. And this is a, a, a sort of uncorrelated with uh, these patterns that would influence selection. So we're gonna use that to estimate the impact of uh, 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 the Ebola crisis. And what we find here is that greater Ebola concerns led to a significantly worse performance by democratic candidates uh, in house elections, in Senate elections, also in gubernatorial elections, right? So there's a, there's a strong impact. How strong? Well, it turns out, uh, just to give you an illustration, that if we think about one standard deviation uh, increase in Ebola concerns as measured by searches or tweets, the results are very similar uh, according to either measure. So one standard deviation increase uh, in concerns, so if you compare places uh, 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 with you know, one standard deviation, uh, uh, higher Ebola concerns, they, uh, Democratic candidates performed uh, uh, worse by 4.3 percentage points. So that's a substantial, uh, a substantial uh, uh, effect. To give you just a sense of how substantial it is, this would have swung, so a, a, a swing of that uh, uh, magnitude would have changed the outcome of 15 races that were won by Republicans by the GOP at, in, in, in that election, which would, for instance, have eliminated all the gains between 2010 and 2014. So the Republicans won uh, 13 uh, seats uh, between 2010 and 2014. So this would essentially sort of a, a swing of that magnitude would have basically uh, uh, eliminated these gains, right? So these are, this is an important effect. And we can uh, attribute that to the, to the causal uh, uh, impact of Ebola concerns uh, um, in that year. So, so that raises the question of, you know, why, uh, uh, why it happened, right? So was it about, uh, you know, voters perhaps blaming incumbents and saying, oh, there's this response or of an inadequate response to this uh, uh, perceived uh, crisis? Well, first thing is we find no effect on Republican incumbents uh, at, at the congressional level or uh, governors. So that's one, one clue right there. But we can actually look at the most visible incumbent, namely President Obama. And back at the time, there was this perception, right? Oh, is Ebola Obama's, these are all headlines from the time. Is, is, Ebola's, is Ebola Obama's Katrina, Katrina's moment? President Obama's Ebola problem. So this was perceived as something like that. And even some celebrities uh, uh, at the time were making mention of that and, and criticizing the response of uh, the president to uh, that perceived uh, crisis at the time. So was it that voters were blaming, blaming uh, President Obama and then Democrats were, were being hurt by association? Well, we can actually look at the Gallup ratings of President Obama, his approval ratings at the time. And we actually have daily measures of that. So we can really uh, look at the timing of uh, 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 you know, the cases and the response of uh, 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 you know, survey respondents to that. And we basically estimate very precisely a zero effect on Obama's approval rating. So Obama's approval rating was not affected by the Ebola crisis, right? So you can say like, you know, people who were uh, uh, making this association, perhaps they didn't like Obama in the first place. So we didn't, we can't detect a, a, a movement of people uh, uh, becoming more negative towards uh, Obama as a result of that. So it seems it, that that was not the case, right? So so what happened? Well, it may be that uh, politicians uh, uh, might be responding to that, uh, 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 and and that may contribute to sort of another type of response uh, uh, from voters that doesn't have to do necessarily with the the the, the uh, their evaluation of the president. So this is just one example here, Senator Rand Paul at the time saying like, look, we are really underplaying the, uh, the threat of Ebola and really kind of associating this with, you know, the border and national security. And, you know, this was seen, uh, was, was uh, you know, uh, anecdotally, uh, there's this perception that Republicans were, uh, were do, Republican candidates in particular were doing that a lot. So we can look at the data and see if that was systematically the case. And here's what we find. So if, uh, one thing that, that uh, we can look at is, so members of Congress, they send newsletters to their constituents and we can analyze the text of these new letters and see what they were talking about. So the solid lines here uh, give you the share of newsletters that uh, are mentioning Ebola, right? And the blue is uh, uh, from Democrats and the red from Republicans, just a random choice of colors here. 
And what we see here is that Republicans start talking about Ebola a lot uh, compared to Democrats. Democrats start you know, to talk about it, they respond to it a little bit, but Republicans a lot more. So the solid line is just mentions to Ebola. And the, the, the dashed lines in a different scale here on the, on the right uh, uh, axis, they're talking about Ebola and immigration at the same time. Right, so they're talking more about Ebola, but they're not just talking more about Ebola in isolation. They're talking about Ebola again, sort of as illustrated by the Rand Paul quote, kind of in in this context of talking about borders and, and you know there's this foreign disease that is threatening us and 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 that type of response, right? So that's just an illustration, sort of a visual illustration. Then we see that it was systematically the case. So Republican politicians start sending more newsletters mentioning Ebola after the first case particularly Republicans involved in competitive races start doing that more. So it really illustrating that it was kind of a strategic response. Uh, those who were kind of more, uh, uh, had more of an incentive to try to, you know, uh, gain these extra votes. They were doing that more often. And they're just not talking just about Ebola. They're talking about Ebola along certain topics as well. One of them is immigration. Another is President Obama. So we can actually uh, uh, track that in the newsletter. So the politicians, are responding to that. We have this evidence from newsletters. We also have evidence from campaign advertising. So for campaign advertising, what we can look at is uh, what is called sort of the fear content of advertising. So this is classified. So we have uh, 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 um, people collecting data on campaign ads and they look at whether there was an appeal to fear based on you know the use of ominous music and uh, 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 you know such criteria. And what we see here is that there is an increase again upon this uh, 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 um, first case in the US where people are, talk, are, are using more fear content. So interestingly, sort of Republicans and Democrats would tend, tended to appeal to fear kind of in a, 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 on a similar rate. But what happens after uh, uh, the first case is not only are they uh, uh, using fear, but they're also using fear in ads that are related to immigration in the case of Republicans and not in the case of Democrats. So there just seems to be this strategic response which, which follows the same pattern. So Republicans start broadcasting more ads with fear content. This is, uh, they, uh, there is an increase for Democrats but the increase is uh, uh, relatively more important for Republicans. Those again in competitive races are doing that more and they're also making this association with immigration and Obama, right? So they're not just, talking about the, the, that threat, but they're talking that in association with certain topics that uh, uh, they, they tend to think uh, might be more favorable to them. Well, maybe that didn't work across the board, it seems, right? Because it's not as if Obama has, uh, you know, became more unpopular as we saw, but was it the case that it affected uh, uh, people's views when it comes to other topics, right? And well, in particular, there is this, uh, 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 um, evidence from sort of the lab experiments that I, that I mentioned briefly at the start, where there is this uh, uh, idea that fear and anxiety is sort of, uh, uh, when, you, when you raise uh, uh, fear and, and, and anxiety, people tend to respond uh, changing uh, their views to sort of more conservative views, right? So is that taking place here in this context where we can look at a number of different uh, 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 um, types of questions that are asked in a survey of voters that was taking place at around that time. And what we see here is that people are not becoming more conservative in general, right? Or more uh, uh, disapproving of Obama for that matter on that serving either. They're not more pro-gun or uh, um, anti-gay marriage. These are all kind of topics that at the time were sort of very much uh, uh, far front for, uh, uh, for, for the Republican party, but they are becoming more anti-immigration, right? So they seem to be responding, but sort of on that specific topic, that seems to, 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 to resonate, right? So it's not just talking about issues in general, talking about you know, President Obama or, or uh, just kind of trying to, to uh, uh, raise that anxiety that might make people sort of more conservative, uh, uh, generally speaking. It seemed to have resonated when it comes to something that people could sort of associate directly with, with the threat, right? So that's at least one possible interpretation. So what we see here is that people uh, 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 you know, we see a significant impact of that anxiety on uh, voting and favoring Republicans over Democrats at that particular uh, uh, point in time. And I say, well, maybe that's because the president was a Democrat. There's kind of some sort of anti-incumbent effect. We don't find that that, ha that happened, right? So there is no uh, uh, evidence of sort of general uh, 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 an impact on disapproval of uh, uh, Obama. 
And it doesn't seem to be about people becoming just sort of more conservative in general, right? But it seems to be kind of something more specific. And even though, you know, Republicans uh, seem to have, uh, 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 you know, the evidence is that they were strategically exploiting that, it didn't quite uh, uh, have an impact in sort of all the dimensions that they were uh, uh, trying to exploit at the time, but it seemed to have stuck with sort of the issue of immigration, which sounds like something that, that could, you know, make sense even sort of whether it's rational or not is a separate question, but uh, something that kind of resonates uh, with voters in a different way. So I'm just going to finish off with some thoughts about sort of what it means for the current context, and then we can uh, uh, open up for a discussion. But I think, you know, when I think about uh, the meaning of this uh, in, in 2020, I think there are some important differences, obviously. So I think the economic and the policy dimensions that, that I was, uh, uh, you know, highlighting at the start, I think are just much bigger uh, uh, now, and they're, they're uh, uh, you know, very likely to have some sort of impact. We still can't quite tell uh, uh, the magnitude and, and, and even the direction. But I would also argue that the fear factor could well be like a lot more uh, significant here as well, because the threat is, is much bigger, right? And there is a similar, uh, 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 you know, sort of a analogous context of sort of this foreign disease. And, and we can see a little bit of that, again, anecdotally sort of playing out uh, 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 right now in terms of, you know, politicians kind of try to associate, you know, this with, you know, the Chinese virus or whatever, sort of this idea of having this foreign disease. And, you know, the evidence suggests that, you know, that kind of worked. Uh, in the context of Ebola. So that I think is something that uh, uh, could be important this year as well. But I think we wanna think about, and just kind of prompting us to, to, to sort of think about this, because you know, uh, uh, I'd be interested to hear what people have to say about that uh, as well. So maybe other associations are, are possible, right? So you know, we can, we can you know, uh, coronavirus can, can get people thinking about other things as well. Uh, uh, and I think this uh, might be, so the kinds of, anxiety that this generates, which, by the way, I think interacts something with the, the economic and sort of the policy uh, aspects of that, I think may, may push in different, in different directions. So uh, I'm going to stop here and just open up for, uh, for discussion. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Philippe, for the, for the presentation. A lot to, lot to think about there. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask the audience to uh, share any questions and comments and thoughts you have for Philippe. And again, you can use either the Q&A function or the chat function. Both of those would work uh, just fine. And I'm going to uh, kind of pick questions from the, from the flow as they come. But before I do that, Philippe, I, I, I want to ask uh, one question uh, myself on the, on the fear aspect. So, could you just tell us a little bit uh, from a technical perspective, like what kind of specification do you use? I'm thinking of terms of like fixed effects and uh, what is the setup here for the study? Yeah, yeah. So just to get a little bit more uh, uh, technical about it. So what we do is, so we need like a, like a source of variation that affects how people, uh, uh, um, how concerned people are uh, with respect to, to Ebola, but uh, uh, is, uncorrelated with uh, uh, sort of other factors that might be uh, uh, unrelated to that particular concern, but would also affect voting behavior, right? So you think, well, you know, people, again, as I, as I mentioned, people might, might be more prone to be uh, anxious about Ebola, but also people uh, who are more prone might also be more likely to, you know, vote Republican for like other reasons, right? Uh, uh, you know, so that's the type of thing that we need to, that we need to uh, uh, you know, guard ourselves against. So the nature of the variation that we have is basically uh, you know, the geographical distance to these uh, uh, particular spots. And this is not randomly distributed, right? So like where you are relative to uh, 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 you know, Dallas or New York or, or Ohio. But what we can do is we can control for pre-existing electoral outcomes. And we can throw in demographic characteristics as well. So we can say like, look, uh, uh, um, if we compare two places that are located uh, uh, at the same distance, let's say from Dallas, Texas, right? But uh, 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 which have the same degree of pre-existing Republicanness, right, so to speak, right? So that's kind of what we're doing, right? So whatever is left here is just a kind of random exposure, right? So this is the this is what we do. So we use the distance 
as an instrumental variable for the Ebola concerns, right? And then we can show, and this is what we do in the paper, that that distance doesn't predict all sorts of other things, in particular kind of political outcomes in previous elections. It doesn't predict Ebola concerns before the, uh, the, the cases in the US emerge. So because of that, uh, 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 all of these uh, 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 um, exercises that we can do, we can say like, look, you know, once we control for that pre-existing uh, republicanism, and we can throw in again, uh, other demographic characteristics as well, uh, uh, that variation is as good as random basically, right? So it just happened that uh, uh, it hit Dallas, Texas, uh, 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 you know, it could have hit, you know, Houston or Phoenix, Arizona, and it didn't. And, you know, so that's the kind of variation that we use. Got it. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Philip. We've got uh, some questions now. So uh, let me just uh, start. Uh, Jill, uh, Jill McGovern is asking, are you planning to conduct another similar research project related to the impact of coronavirus? Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a, that's a very natural thing to do. And actually, there's a, some uh, uh, research already by uh, uh, one of our faculty as well, Dan Honig, who has looked at the uh, uh, sort of the correlation between exposure to coronavirus and the Democratic primary vote. And he finds that, or they find him and, uh, and uh, his co-author, they find that uh, it seems to have uh, uh, um, been associated with better performance for, for Joe Biden, right? So, uh, you know, there's, there is uh, uh, sort of the natural question here, and it would be natural to, to sort of extend this to our context. We're sort of looking at the, 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 the impact that this has on, you know, Republican versus Democrats and sort of kind of trying to isolate that uh, uh, fear component. The thing is, uh, what makes it more challenging here uh, uh, in, in terms of the specific question of what is the, 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 the role that anxiety plays, in all of this is that it's, it's not just this pure anxiety shock, right? Unlike uh, uh, what we could argue for Ebola. So now it's really affecting lives in all sorts of different dimensions. So I think we could, we could study kind of a slightly different question, which is, so what happens when you put all of these things together, right? The, the, the anxiety, but also the economic uh, impact and the sort of how you judge the policy response, what is the impact of that? Uh, 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 so I think that that is something that is definitely kind of in the agenda as well. And, and it, it, it may well have a, a strong impact, as I said, but it's, it's just hard to disentangle, harder to disentangle what, what is precisely driving this. Excellent, Thank you. That, that's, that's very good to hear. Next I have, uh, Kei Tang is asking about any theories that would explain why conservatives are more sort of reactive to this kind of crisis and uncertainty. What is it that is driving this? Reaction? Yeah, uh, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, so there's, there is a sort of political psychology literature that uh, uh, um, relates to that. And I would say there are, there are sort of hypotheses around it, but it's not something necessarily that we, that we kind of understand super well. But there's this idea that uh, uh, people have sort of these different types of personalities, right? And, and uh, so things like, you know, openness to, to, to experience or, or uh, um, uh, uh, sort of more uh, uh, people being kind of more prone to to uh, uh, you know fear uh, has these so, sort of psychological purely psychological associations that map onto sort of more conservative uh, uh, political positions right so it's something like well if I am more uh, uh, um, uh, I'm less open to new experiences I might be kind of more concerned with uh, or, or more wary of foreigners that might be associated with certain political positions. But this is not something that we, I, I would say that we understand super well. I think there are, there, there are kind of hypotheses uh, uh, around this. And what I think where our research speaks to that is first kind of showing that uh, something like that might have an impact, you know, not just in the lab, but kind of in real elections with uh, where kind of real things uh, at stake, but also that it, that it, it is something kind of a little bit more specific than just a sort of this general uh, uh, association of like anxiety kind of leading to sort of more generally conservative, conservative attitudes. It, it has to be tied, it has to be tethered to some kind of uh, 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 something that sort of makes sense in people's minds, right? In, the, in, in sort of this narrative sense. And that's what the politicians were kind of trying to, to get at at the time, right? They were really saying like, look, uh, 
you know, and we can find a number of quotes. There was a Rand Paul, uh, a Paul uh, uh, quote. We, we find others. We have others like in the paper. You know, we have these people coming uh, across the border, like they're bringing disease. Uh, uh, we need to, uh, so they're kind of making these associations that kind of resonate. Whereas if the anxiety had been driven by, you know, snakes, uh, then people wouldn't have had the same response, arguably. That, that's at least kind of one interpretation that comes from this. So it has to be something kind of a little bit more uh, subtle than just sort of a generic conservative response. Excellent, that's, that's very good. Uh, next I have uh, Andrea Miotto is asking two questions. Uh, one is very interesting. If you were a challenging candidate, you're challenging an incumbent. So what do you take from this research? Like, What is the practical strategy here? Yeah, I, that's, that's a great question. And, and I've been thinking about that quite, <laughs> quite a lot. You know, if I put my political strategist uh, uh, hat, I think it's a tough question. And I, and I think it's, it's asymmetrically tough, I would say, uh, uh, for Democrats and Republicans uh, uh, in this case. And, and it, so, so the association uh, for, for, so if I'm a Republican strategist, the association seems quite clear and that's what they did with Ebola and that's what they seem to be doing now, right? So like you're kind of trying to trigger so an association with, you know, foreigners and immigration, you know, if immigration sort of anti-immigrant uh, uh, um, attitudes or sentiment is something that uh, uh, benefits me uh, as a politician, that's a natural way to go, right? So that's kind of an easy, an easy part. Well, you might say, well, maybe one thing that you can try to do is to, is to kind of try to create an association with the incumbent, right? Well, what our research is telling us is that this isn't automatic, right? It's like by saying that you might not necessarily kind of just create this uh, 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 response here. It's like, oh, there's a crisis going on. I'm gonna be upset with, uh, with the incumbent uh, uh, as a result of that. That's not automatic. Obviously right now is a much, uh, you know, different magnitude. So again, sort of the policy uh, uh, aspect of it, which uh, I was uh, uh, trying to, to, to uh, differentiate there is much bigger now. So, you know, I think that there might be something there, but in terms of the pure psychological dimension, it's not clear. So, you know, maybe you could try to, 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 to sort of uh, talk about anxiety related to like your, like healthcare, uh, uh, and, you know, because people are, are going to be concerned about that. So that's like one possibility. But I think the, the big lesson is it has to be something that sort of makes sense in people's minds, right? Uh, and not just kind of a generic uh, anxiety effect that will just lead people to behave in a certain way sort of across the board, right? So with my political strategist hat, I would say like, look, we need to find something that uh, uh, resonates in this way, right? If we want to get that uh, 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 emotional leverage, either working in our favor or just kind of trying to counteract whatever it is that your opponent might might be trying to do, right? Along that dimension, I think that's what you need to think about. And and I think it's 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 a bit more natural, easier to think about what that would be in the context of a pandemic, kind of coming from uh, uh, from abroad on the Republican side uh, 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 than than on the Democratic side if we're thinking about U.S. politics. Excellent. Okay, so we've got the strategy here, Felipe. If you decide to, <laughs> uh, so what was the second question? Did you did you did you because you said there were two questions? Oh uh, yes. So I'm gonna get. Uh, I'll just uh, take another question I from A, and I'll, I'll get back to it. I uh, see. Yeah. Second. So the next question is from John Cover, who's asking, "How do you plan to separate the fear of the fir virus versus the economic fear?" So is there a way to do this? Yeah. So that's 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 a that's a hard question, right? And that's why. Uh, you know, the Ebola context from that, uh, uh, you know, social science perspective of sort of try to understand that, 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 you know, emotional component is, is very well suited to that in a way that like COVID uh, really isn't. So, you know, if we're thinking about uh, 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 how we would go about doing something like that, you can say like, look, we can try to condition on the size of the economic shock. So if you imagine like the, the economic shock is going to be different uh, and it's gonna be felt differently in different parts of the US, right? So you could say like, look, maybe we can try to, uh, uh, you know, hold constant the economic environment in some way you can control for, you know, the unemployment rate uh, uh, or something like that. But obviously the unemployment rate is also what we would uh, uh, call endogenous, right? In, a, in, a, in social science lingo, right? It's not something that is, uh, 
randomly assigned and is also being affected by emotions, for instance, right? So, you know, the, the way people respond uh, uh, emotionally to, to the crisis affects their economic behavior, which in turn affects. So it is a very hard question from an empirical perspective and, and, and uh, uh, you know, we'll certainly be thinking about it, but it's not one that has an obvious, that, that has an obvious question, right? So the way I would look at this is say like, look, there, they will be, the, the, there's going to be this, this package of emotional responses and the economic fallout and sort of how you think about the policy response and so on and so forth. And this is going to be related to the degree of exposure to the COVID threat. Uh, uh, and we can try to estimate what's going to be the, 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 the end uh, uh, result of all of these things uh, combined. But to disentangle the different components, I think is a very hard question uh, uh, to which I haven't found the answer yet, but I'll certainly be thinking about it. All right, excellent. Uh, next question is from Yam Zhang, uh, who is asking about Trump's use of the uh, term Chinese virus. So what do you think this term is going to do? Is it going to have an impact on the voters? Is this going to have some impact on the voting behavior? So, you know, I think the, 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 the conclusion that follows from, from our evidence is that it, it may well have an impact, right? So it, it really is sort of this is a strategy that is very much consistent with what we see in the response to the Ebola crisis, right? So the idea that sort of this association uh, between the disease and foreigners, right, uh, uh, resonated, right? So I think it's not surprising that uh, uh, people uh, did that at the time. So I think, you know, that, that, that was kind of like the intuition that people had. They also had the intuition of sort of trying to connect that with Obama, which doesn't seem to have worked. Uh, uh, but that one did, and, and, I, and I see this current crisis as sufficiently comparable uh, uh, to the Ebola crisis in that dimension, right? It's like this foreign, you know, this disease that kind of uh, came to the U.S. from abroad that it can resonate. And obviously, when, you, when you're talking about the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus or what have you, clearly that's what you're trying to do. You're kind of trying to raise that association. So our, our results suggest that, yeah, it may well, it may well work. Uh, but obviously there are all sorts of other things going on, right? And this is pulling in one direction, but there are all, all other, uh, you know, many other things that are pulling in all sorts of different directions. Then again, what's going to be the ultimate impact of COVID is just going to be sort of the, the, the confluence of all these different things. But I think that piece uh, uh, makes sense in light of the, of the evidence that we find from Trump's and, uh, and the Republicans' perspective. Got it, say. okay, excellent, very, very insightful. So we have uh, both uh, Andrea Mioto earlier and uh, Ji Ping Wang are asking about, you know, differential uh, responses along kind of socioeconomic lines. So what do you think, are there some variables like gender, race, mm. age that are producing heterogeneous effects? That's a great question. Uh, we haven't looked at it uh, very much yet, so I'm going to actually take note of that. That's that's a great suggestion. That's one of the great things about uh, 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 this type of seminars that we get uh, a great suggestion. I mean, I think we can uh, try to speculate a little bit uh, uh, about. So, from from again from a, a social science perspective, it's 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 a it's a hard question because gender all these characteristics, right? Socioeconomic status or, or uh, race and what have you, these are not randomly distributed uh, across the population in the sense that uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, of, of different socioeconomic status, they differ in all sorts of different, of other ways, right? So just looking at whether the impact is bigger, let's say for, for uh, people with higher income or for women or for uh, minorities or what have you, doesn't really, nail down the, 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 let's say the sort of the, the, the causal impact of that demographics, right? So, we, but it's interesting sort of from a, I think from a, from a descriptive perspective, right? So you'd say like, look, you know, is this uh, uh, being processed? Is, is, is that having a stronger impact on, you know, for women or for men that it is like, we can't say if it's because 
of the gender, of, but it's just kind of a correlation. But I think it's very interesting. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, which, which is actually, I think, important, is that one thing that we find is that there was a negative impact on turnout as well. So it's not just that Democrats, so like Democrats had, had lower, uh, uh, um, worse performance, but turnout was lower as well. And by you now quite substantively, and, and that those elections in particular were the lowest turnout, you know, since like 1942 uh, uh, at the time. So it was like a really low turnout. And we can say, well, maybe there was, uh, uh, or, 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 you know, our evidence shows that part of that uh, uh, would have been driven by sort of this response to Ebola, which you might say, well, is that about people being perhaps afraid of, you know, being, you know, sort of some sort of social distancing uh, 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 2014 version, or it might be just because different kinds of people might be become sort of less motivated uh, or the like. Uh, but I think it, it's also kind of an, uh, an interesting wrinkle of that. But, but, uh, but I think the heterogeneity aspect, as we would call it, right, like seeing if this is different for different types of, uh, of people along different dimensions, I think is a very interesting point. So I, I just took note of that. That was, uh, that was very helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, excellent, Philip. Um, next, I have one more question from Ling Chen. Name somehow rings a bell to me. Um, <laughs> uh, she's asking about uh, coronavirus in China. So one of the things that's important about coronavirus is that because there is this connection, uh, the sort of original outbreak was in China. Do you think there would be kind of effects uh, in both parties? Is there possible sort of racist sentiment? What is your thinking on this issue? So is it about the impact on sort of how China is viewed in the U.S. or is it about sort of the impact in China? I think more to, on the sort of U.S. Like how do people yeah. in the U.S. perceive this? Yeah, and I, the, the com competitive nature and all that. I think I think that's that, that's actually an interesting point. I mean, so I would say that uh, you know, and the and the the research I think backs that up. That 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 might well kind of lead to sort of worse. Uh, views of China, kind of uh, like greater sort of anti-Chinese uh, uh, sentiment. I think particularly so if, uh, you know, people are kind of raising this association, right, and sort of, let's say, strategically uh, uh, exploiting that association. But the partisan balance or sort of the partisan, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, impact uh, of that, I think it's, it's a little bit harder to tell. I think it, it's it's sort of anti-Chinese rhetoric. Kind of more recently, is something that Trump kind of has uh, 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 brought to the forefront, like quite a, quite quite a bit. Uh, so it's in some sense, it's kind of it has become kind of a, a relatively more Republican uh, uh, issue than it than it was before. But but I, I, it's not clear to me that Democrat. Democratic voters uh, uh, typically kind of would have had more positive views about China sort of in the first place. So that I think is, a, is an interesting distinction there, uh, uh, which might make that sort of the partisan impact of this uh, uh, different in important ways. I think it's a very good point. So, you know, the analogy uh, 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 breaks down a little bit. The analogy between uh, uh, coronavirus and Ebola sort of breaks down a little bit on that front, right? So, so I think that's, that's, an, that's an excellent question. And that's something that we could investigate as well. So one thing that we've been thinking about, uh, me and my uh, research uh, team here, is sort of try to think about corona, sort of the impact of coronavirus on, on uh, you know, anti-Chinese, you know, rhetoric or, 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 or even, you know, violence as the case may be, like in different places, kind of in the context of this of this crisis right now. So I think, and sort of the electoral impact of that is, is very, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. So I think it's a very, another thing to take, take note of. Very, very interesting. Um, excellent. So um, I, there, there's one more question from Andrea. Let's take this one more question and then I think we can, we can conclude. So he's asking, what about, uh, how is the sort of sentiment uh, about uh, China and uh, uh, the, the Chinese people is this kind of sort of backlash of racist sentiment also growing in other countries? Is it just the United States or is this happening in Europe, uh, maybe Brazil, that's a country you know very well. Any, any thoughts on that? It's an excellent question. And I think uh, um, there is, I would say anecdotal 
uh, I even refrain from calling it evidence, uh, uh, but anecdotes about that and, and rhetoric. I mean, just to give you the example of Brazil, I mean, you, you, you've seen uh, 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 politicians uh, 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 kind of try to play up this, you know, Chinese connection and really kind of try to drum up uh, 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 sort of anti-Chinese uh, sentiment on a frankly, like quite explicitly racist uh, 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 way. But that's where I think it would be very interesting. And again, there's something that we're, we're thinking about right now to sort of bring some data into the picture and kind of look at. Uh, 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 so one thing that we're thinking about is, is, is again, sort of looking at uh, 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 online activity uh, as one uh, uh, dimension of that, sort of looking at how people are, if there are sort of like racist, you know, searches or tweets or, or the like, the kind of data that we're exploiting here, kind of looking into that. And you can think about like uh, uh, incidents of, of violence, although I think these are, might be kind of less frequent. So we, we may, at, at least up to this point, I mean, kind of, uh, fortunately, I mean, it's, it's probably not zero, but, uh, uh, but maybe like we don't, it's not gonna be easy to find like enough sort of variation in the data to, to say something with confidence about that. So maybe sort of the, the, the online sort of as a, as a proxy for that kind of sentiment, I think is, is one way to go. So that's like, we've been thinking about that because it's a natural hypothesis here. And, and obviously it will go very much in line with what we, what we see in, in, the, Ebola, in the Ebola experiment. So I think that's a, that's, that's a very good uh, question that we've, we've been thinking about. Okay, perfect. Um, so we are approaching the end of our time. So I, I think we can, we can finish here. I'd just like to remind everybody that uh, this is uh, one of the events that we are doing here at SAIS. So we have a very active uh, program, both on coronavirus and other related issues in the coming two months. So what I'm doing is I'm putting into the chat window the link to our campus events website where you can find lots of new activity in the coming two months. We really put a lot of effort into this and I'm very glad to have uh, leading experts like Philippe uh, describe their work and giving all these insights uh, for us. So thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Philippe, for an outstanding presentation and taking all these exciting questions. I hope we can all uh, continue this discussion and uh, uh, continue learning and kind of navigating our way out of this. Yeah, very thank difficult. you very much. It was, it, was, it, was, it was great. Thank you a lot for, thanks a lot for everyone for the engagement and some really great questions and really great suggestions. And I, I'm living with a lot of food for thought. So that, that was great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye. See you all later. Bye-bye.